begin again this evening by opening our Bibles to Ecclesiastes. We are in lesson six, but still in chapter three and four. So let's work that out. I'm going to read a few verses for us because we're not going to go too far into four. Let me read from chapter three, verse 14, on down through um, chapter four verse six so three verse 15 uh, that which is already has been and that which is to be already has been and God seeks what has been driven away moreover I saw under the sun that in the place of justice even there was wickedness and in the place of righteousness even there was wickedness I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time and a matter for every work. And I said in my heart, with regard to the children of man, that God is testing them, that they see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to beasts is the same. As one dies, so the other dies. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to the dust all return. Who knows whether uh, the spirit of man goes upward, and the spirit of beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. For who can bring him to see what will be after him? Chapter 4, verse 1. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought, the dead are already, who are already dead are more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are under the sun. I saw the toil, all the toil and all the skill in work uh, comes from a man's envy of his neighbor. This is also vanity and a striving after the wind. The fool folds his hand and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness and two than two hands full of toil and striving after the wind. Again, a quick prayer and we'll dig in. Lord, as we open up and consider just a few things from these sections of Ecclesiastes tonight, our desire is, as always, is that we would extrapolate from it wisdom, practical, pertinent, relevant wisdom uh, that helps us to see the futility of this world, particularly this world uh, without Christ, this world when it's just supposed by men to be an end unto itself. And Lord, we just pray that we'll understand something of the, uh, of the scope of these things and, and, and some of the direction. Lord, bless our consideration this evening, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So even really briefly going back to chapter 3, verse 14, he said this. We see it on page 1 in your notes. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing, and nor anything taken away from it. God has done it so that people fear before Him. Now, that, that is such an interesting phrase when you look at it. Because he's been, he's been tracing out along the way how much work He has done and committed Himself to. Building the house, building the palaces. He's spoken of the undertakings and the toil and the accumulation of a lot of men. But no matter what you and I do, it doesn't last forever. And no matter what we build up, it will not endure. It's going to be passed on to somebody else, and the ravages of time will diminish it, or thieves will come in, moths will come in, something will destroy it. 
Kind of when we look forward and we see the teachings of Christ in the New Testament, particularly, again, those who have recently been rereading the early part of Matthew through McShane's have read afresh that seek ye first the kingdom of God and the reminder of the difference between where your treasures are. You don't want to store your treasures up on earth. Why? Because moth will eat, rust will destroy, thieves will steal. So you store your treasures in heaven. But I've oft reminded you of this, if you're storing your treasures in heaven, it's clearly a different kind of treasure. Because you can't put your clothes in a heavenly closet, you know, so that the moths won't get them. You can't put your gold in a heavenly vault so that thieves cannot steal it. So it's telling you rather, rather than the location of storage, it's talking about a different or distinctive treasure. And the treasure is not the things of this earth. The Gentiles seek after those things. You don't worry about those things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added to you. As you fulfill your practical duties and responsibilities in this world, you will make sufficient money to put a roof overhead and to put food in your mouth as you carry out your ordinary human responsibilities. What is required to live, you will get it. Don't worry about it. Because look, even the flowers of the field have a glory. And who provides it for them? God does. And so through the ordinary responsibility that God has laid upon men to labor, I just want to note that, when did God lay that responsibility upon men? Before the fall. God took Adam before the fall and he made the Garden of Eden and he put Adam in the garden to work it and to till it. All right, labor is not a, a, the result of sin. Sometimes I think people have the mi- messed up notion that if God, if Adam had not sinned, we would have all been like on permanent retirement. You know, with, with you know from day one. And, and some sort of uh, quasi-socialism without taxes where everybody would just get something sent to them and mailed to them for doing nothing. That's not the way it was even from the beginning. The fall meant that the, the work was going to become harder. <laughs> that, that, that his, uh, uh, the earth's cooperation was no longer there. So now it's going to be by sweat, by exhaustion, and and there's going to be thorns. It's going to be hard. Okay? But the, the, the work and the responsibility was there. But the difference that it begins to point out here, as he's spoken of... Our, our labors, ultimately, whatever we amass, we don't take with us. Whatever we build will eventually be weakened and be destroyed. I mean, if you notice, um, we have these things called the seven great wonders of the world. But do a little bit of study. We have the present seven great wonders of the world, and there are the ancient seven great wonders of the world. The lists are different because a number of the ancient seven great are no longer in existence. They're gone, you know. And, and for whatever the beauty that we may imagine in Solomon's temple, it was gone. And then it was rebuilt. And then it was gone. And then it was rebuilt. And it is gone. And even now, it ain't there. If you were to show up in that place, it seems something else is is where the temple was. Something that seems highly inappropriate for its location. But what God does, 
I mean, I, I always love these contrasts. What God does endures forever. You know, the, the, I, I, we, we speak of God being incomparable. You can't compare him. To whom will you compare him? Well, the only way you can is a comparison by contrast. Sinful, without sin. Easily deceived, cannot be deceived. Unjust, compromised, just, unrighteous, righteous, wicked. But now, remember, and it made people uncomfortable, Jesus said to the smattering of people around him, if you then, who are wicked, know how to give good things to your children, how much more your heavenly Father? But don't miss what happened in that statement. If you then, who are Wicked. That's the natural condition of man. And we, in terms of our earthly lives, temporary. Him, eternal. And so it's just astounding when we look at these things. And, and so it says later in chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Consider the work of God, who can make straight what God has made crooked. Now, I, I, I'm so thankful for that particular sentence because you know what somebody might think? Uh-oh, it's crooked. Somebody at some point might be in a nation where they're not happy about the direction that it seems to be going. And they might say, you know, this nation it seems to be a nation that is bent and going in the wrong direction. And, and think, what will we do? Oh no! Ah. And, and, and somehow, maybe mistakenly think, this is not how God would want it to be. Almost with this phrasing, which is completely wrong. If God were in control, then it would get back on this path. Uh, I mean, I understand the logic in that, but God is in control. God was in control even as the serpent went into the garden and deceived Eve. God was in control and well aware even as Cain was lifting up a rock to kill his brother. None of the wicked deeds of men catch God by surprise. Nothing catches God by surprise. He has absolute power. Was it his purpose to intervene and stop it? He could have absolutely crushed the serpent's head before that slithering tongue began to speak. Right? He could have ended it, but he did not. He wanted to make known his power and his wrath his justice, and His mercy. And so we've got to understand this. Look, some we think it's bent. If God has purposed to give Egypt for an extended season over to a wicked Pharaoh, if He is determined to give Israel over to a wicked king of Assyria or Babylon, then you know what's going to happen? Yeah. So it's important to note this. If, if, if God has made it bent, who can make it straight? No one. And if God's made it straight, who can bend it? And even as you say no, and I, I guess there's one caveat that I might want to throw in there. If God has made it bent, He can make it straight. If God has made it straight, He can also make it bent. And we've, 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 we've seen that happen. You know? And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you think we're in a time of straightening or bending. <laughs> 
you know, I'll leave that to your own assessment. But the reality is this, and sometimes I want to remind people of this. Uh, we live in an age where people think the most powerful thing that you can do is protest. I want to tell you this very clearly. The most powerful thing we can do is pray. Because protest is our attempt to move men. And men's egos sometimes, yeah, they do the opposite of what you're trying to get them to do just to show how powerful they are. And so, you get, but I tell you this, when we plead with God, if God wants, He can change the hearts of men, the minds of men. The direction of men. Watch out for people who, who, who like to say, you can't just sit there and pray. you got to get out there and do something. As if prayer isn't really doing anything. And I would tell them, well, maybe part of the problem, and I say, you know, say the sort of tongue-in-cheek, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So maybe the reason why your prayers <laughs> seem to be having no effect, maybe what your life is about and committed to isn't what God's about and committed to. You know? uh, you're finding your prayers ineffectual. Do not blame God. Trust His purposes and you pursue righteousness by which you might find your prayers avail more greatly. And one thing you'll find is the more righteous you get, the more sure your prayers are going to have this clear undertone. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Because who said that? Jesus, who is also known by the unique term, the righteous one. You know who else among us is known by that term? No one. <laughs> Not a one of us. Jesus was the righteous one. And so, again, um, noting in this, um, as it said in e Ecclesiastes 7.14, In the day of prosperity be joyful, and in the day of adversity consider God has made one as well as the other. So for those who, 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 who might be bemoaning, and I understand it, the possible, you know, grieving over the possible adversity that could come against freedoms and against churches uh, in the coming days. Hey, the day of prosperity and ease and the day of adversity and oppression. Who made them both? Who's over them both? Remember, God is the one who has told us about the great tribulation that is to come. I mean, I don't know if we like to always pretend, well, that's just a, that's just a Bible thing for some time way out in, in the future. Uh, there has been tremendous persecution of the church and of Christians in the past. There is increasing, there is global persecution going on. There is increasing persecution even now. We do know, not know what the future will hold short term. But long term, we know this. Things are going to go from bad to worse, and then the end will come. So it's going to seem more and more bent you know so the, so there's mixed feelings on the one side people run around chanting unfair injustice immoral is a wrong you know and, and hey that means men are still being men <laughs> to a degree maybe levels of restraint are being removed we may be moving closer to that great tribulation, of which none of us necessarily long for, but we long for that coming of our Savior, don't we? Yes, we do. 
And so it says this in Numbers, and don't, don't, don't lose this thought. God is not a man that he should lie. What a distinctiveness. The, the confidence in, in his word, or the son of man that he should change his mind. He is not, he, he does, his plan is fixed in eternity and unfolding progressively. He's not figuring it out and changing his mind as he goes. And often I remind us of this, our prayers are never designed to change his mind. Our prayers are, are a recognition that he has the power. Now listen to this, and I, and I say this because some people will say, well, if God's already figured everything out and he already knows everything, which he does, that's called omniscient. God is omniscient. He knows everything. Then he already knows what's going to happen tomorrow. So why should I pray? He already knows what's going to be. So why should I pray? He's already decided what tomorrow will be. That is true. But God also, in, the, in His decrees of what will be, He already knows what will be tomorrow. But you know what else He has always also already known? What I would pray today. So... <laughs> In, 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 in his purpose and plan for tomorrow, it takes into account his people's prayers today. So do not take it lightly, brothers and sisters. It's not that it has no effect. Our prayers have effect. Now it's hard for us to get because God's so much not like us. But he has always known our cries, our pleadings, our needs, uh, and that is wonderfully and blessedly and mercifully considered in the unfolding of His plan. Uh, I urge you to read the remainder of those verses yourself that just speak of the establishment of, of God's absolute, everlasting, unchanging dominion. His dominion everlasting. His kingdom from generation to generation. Whereas men's, a king gets one generation. That's it. A kingdom has a limited number of generations. You know, it, it, it's interesting because you, you, you go back 300 years ago, and I don't want to make any of you patriots uncomfortable, but 300 years ago, the United States of America wasn't the most powerful country in the world. Okay? Now, how do we know that? Yeah, because 300 years ago, we weren't here. And, and, and you go back, you know, every 300 and every 500 years, and you do a calculation, and, well, this was the mo most powerful country at this time, and this was the most powerful at this time, and this is the most powerful at this time. How many of those that have, have held the, the momentary place of earthly political preeminence have been able to maintain that indefinitely. Where's Babylon? Where's Assyria? Where's Egypt? Uh, I mean, the places are still there, but, you know, nobody is generally thinking, wow, Egypt is a dominant world power. No? I say Egypt, and what do you think of? Poverty and pyramids. <laughs> it, 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 we just, it, it, and so, are we sure that 50 years, 100 years from now, America will still be the world power? I don't know. Well, will it be China? I don't know. It, who does know? God. And I don't need to worry about it. Because God has not entrusted to me the responsibility as to who will be the next great power. You know, the, I can be committed to and responsible for the things that he has given to me. And with the things that he's given to men, men have not done what they're supposed to do. It tells us, uh, we see this 
in uh, Ecclesiastes. It says, Moreover, I saw, I'm in, in the point number two, chapter three, verse 16, under the sun, that in the place of justice, there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there, there was wickedness. Now, we remember what the scriptures say. He has shown thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Right? I mean, this is what the scriptures so wonderfully declare. What, is, what ought man do? Be just. What does man do? Not just. In the place where there should be justice, even there was wickedness. It's funny that people think that's a new thing. <laughs> you know, it, it has been in every place where there's ever been human beings. And in the place of righteousness, even there there was wickedness. I said in my heart, and this is an important thing, I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time and a matter for everything. What is man's responsibility? To do justly, to show mercy, to do righteously, to walk uprightly. And what does man do? Iniquity, sin, self. And he thinks he answers to no one. But what does this passage say very clearly? I mean, very simply, I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous, and the wicked. There is a time and season for everything. So I, I urge some people who, 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 who tend to an unrest state of heart at this time. Oh, wrong, 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 and woe is the wrong, and we got to fix the wrong. And Look, everybody is going to be held accountable for everything they've done. The books will be opened. Every deed done in the body. I mean, right now people are thinking, oh no, we, we got only 10 days. We got we to teach this present president a lesson. We got to get this done. We got to show him something. I don't know what all that will really accomplish. But, but the reality is, do they, their, their thoughts seem to be, if we don't do this and make a show right now, he's going to get away with it. Nobody gets away with anything. If it's wrong, they're going to answer for it. If it's right and you wrong, then that, that's, you'll find that out too. Right? It's just so amazing how, how we oft put ourselves in, in that place of God. But when we understand that, we can see injustice and we don't wink. We don't take, take it lightly and we say, oh, it don't matter. No, it, it, we, we certainly want to cast our voice in, cast our votes in whatever way we can. We certainly want to cry out to God against injustice and against oppression. But we don't have to let it become the... the the thing that defines our lives. I mean, this is what scares me. It, for believers, there is a singular reality that defines our life, and that is Christ Jesus. He has preeminence in everything. And, and if, if, if any other thing, however noble, and justice is noble, but if that becomes more important than Christ, more, more of our identity than Christ. We've missed it. God help us. You know. All right, and, and I want to keep going in this, but so we see this. Um, verse 18 says, interesting, I said in my heart with regard to the children of men, God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. Every one of us? 
I, mean, I got to tell you this, you know, you, you, you look at some of it, anybody who can't look at their life and see their shortcomings, their failures, their iniquity, their inadequacy, but, but is full of themselves, something's amiss. Because the, 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 the test of God ought to reveal, you know what? Left to myself, there is nothing in terms of qualities in me that are better than the beast. I need the grace of God. Right? Let me keep reading it. It says again, um, what happens to men... Uh, happens to beasts and it speaks about how they all die all are of the dust and all turn to dust again remember genesis 2 7 said these simple words then the lord god formed man out of the dust of the ground you know i, I don't want you to miss this sometimes we we miss it because uh, the the word there i think dust is a is a word that softens it you know, if, if, I, if I expand the word a little bit, it is dry earth. If I contract that again, it's dirt. Okay. <laughs> he formed us out of the dirt of the ground. I don't know why some of us think dust is a little bit more cautious, a little bit more sweet. I mean, I may be dust, but I'm not dirt. Uh, you know, and look, somebody somewhere I, I said this is going to say to you, is say something mean to you like that. You know, you're nothing but dirt. You're not going to amount to anything. And what can you say? Amen. A p but for the grace of God. And the believer will always say that, don't they? Regarding the things that they've seen men do and the failures. But for the grace of God, there go I. But for the grace of God, there go I. Because the one who, take heed the one who thinks he stand, why? Lest he fall. Because the reason why you've stood, if you have stood firm, is the grace of God. Because I don't, want, I don't want to oversimplify it, but if I was to quote out of John 15, Jesus says these words, Apart from me, you can do nothing. All right, so let's make a list of those things that we can do that are, that are pleasing to God. That are, that are right? No, everything falls short of the glory of God. Hebrews says it this way, without faith, you cannot please Him. So when we're in, when we're in our sin, before, before our salvation, apart from faith, every single act falls short of the glory of God. Even our noble deeds are not in honor and glory of the Creator, but they're in honor of the created. We've exchanged the glory of the Creator for the creation, as it says in Romans 1. That's also not acceptable. I, it's, it gets even scarier what we had spoken of earlier because the, the Scripture speaks of judgment, not only of every deed done in the body, but even of every careless word that is uttered. If that does not make you thankful for the forgiveness that is ours in Christ Jesus, then you have a bad memory. And I say that with love. All right. Ecclesiastes 7.20 Surely there is not a righteous man on the earth who does good and never sins. And then it says in, in chapter 3, uh, verse 15, God requireth that which is past. And there's so many things that people go on and on about, and, and it's hard to know exactly what that passage means, but I prefer and think best to understand it, that it in this simple way. When God first made men, you know what was their condition? Very good. We often call it the condition of innocence. 
right? Adam and Eve in the garden without sin. That's what God requires of men. Without sin. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Because what does he get from men? Sin. And so what did he do? He sent his own son. And what requirement did his son meet? Sinless righteousness. And not only that, then the scriptures tell us of that divine transaction that's hard for us to fathom, where he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we would be made the righteousness of God in Him. What? So what does God require? Righteousness. What am I in Christ? Righteous. And I've got to say that in Christ, because if I don't have that in Christ, I don't have that righteousness. And, and anybody and everybody who will ever stand forgiven and accepted at the day of judgment will only be on the same exact basis. He bore our sins in His own body on the tree. Isn't that it? He took them, bore them away. And we, because of that, have been made alive in Christ unto righteousness. Whew. All right, go on with me to the second, second page, uh, which is uh, oppression, injustice, and authority. Look at what it says in chapter 4, verse 1 and following. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. So listen, who's in control uh, ultimately in, in sway of every day? God, and yet what does happen under the sun? Oppressions. You know, some, in case you're not aware, the book of Ecclesiastes was not written in 2020. And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. That carries the sense of, that everyone's powerless to, to stop that oppression that, that's coming on you. I can't alleviate it, can't take it away, can't soften it. You know, it, it's not that they, someone can't speak words of comfort, but there are certain circumstances where you're kind of like, all right, please, the words of comfort here uh, would be, you know, a tree has fallen on you. You want someone to pull that tree off of you rather than just stand there and saying, it's going to be okay. You're going to make it, you're going to make it through. Uh, thank you. Can you move the tree? Right? But this is, this is carrying that sense. But look, he's not even done. And it goes on to say this. Uh, on the side of their oppressors, there was power and there was no one to comfort them. Which meant... No matter what happened, it kept a coming. <laughs> the oppressors kept coming. There was no one who would stop it. There was no one who could stop it among men. And that's just the way it was. So what their life was presently was oppressed. What it was going to be moving forward is oppressed. I mean, it's terrible, right? But... That's the way it was going to be. And that's oft how it is in the world. We, I don't know where we began to, to suddenly think that we live in a world in which there won't be any oppression, there won't be any injustice. What are we thinking? You know, it's going to be there. And also we somehow live in a world where we think when there is oppression, uh, somehow we're, we're, we're entitled to deliverance from it and reparations for it. Look, we are going to be granted by the grace of God in all eternity far more than any ridiculous reparations could do. First of all. Secondly, 
they're going to pay. The oppressors are going to pay far more than anything that we can think of. Uh, and and let, let's unpack this just a little further as, as we see this. Um, and then of course, so under those circumstances, he's kind of, try, because he understands the severity of the oppressions, he's kind of saying, yeah, it might be better to be dead. Ah, might be better to have never been. Yeah, there you go. Uh, noting the severity and constancy of the oppression. He says this in chapter 5, verse 8. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness. Wait, this was happening even then? Mm. Do not be amazed at the matter. Why are you surprised when this happens? For, look, but note this. You, don't be shocked, but, but know this. The high official, he's watched by a higher official. And... There are yet higher officials over them. And as we already saw from our earlier passages, and every one of those officials at every level is ultimately going to answer to who? The highest official. He has appointed that there will be a day of judgment. God, Christ will judge the living and the dead. Yes? It is appointed for one man once to die... And after that, the judgment. So, they're going to get it. And so, that, that's, that's why we can be a people who in the midst of oppression, we can still be people of praise, you know? He will deliver, and He will deliver me from oppression, and He will deliver unto them wrath, you know? I will be set free because of the mercies of God in Christ, and they will bear judgment in their themselves. Sometimes read through the Psalms, and you can see how David at times sort of relishes the judgment that will befall the wicked at some point. Now, please note this. Though that's true, we are supposed to pray for everyone. We're supposed to love our enemies. We're supposed to pray for those who persecute us. Okay? Because look, God forgave us much. And, and, and who's going to really love the Lord? Those who are forgiven much. We think of how much Paul had persecuted the church, and then we think, how much persecution was he willing to then endure for the sake of the church and the name of Christ? Right? And so pray for those who persecute you, that they may become, uh, you know, your friend. That they may join you as the persecuted. <laughs> They may join you as the oppressed because there's a sense in which we will be those people. Jesus says, look, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He tells that clearly to Timothy. He also tells his own disciples abundantly clearly in John 18 and John 15. He says things like this, if they hated me, they will hate you. If they persecuted me, they persecuted you. They called him a servant of, or even sometimes, some passages say they called him Beelzebub. Some say, speaking of him wielding the power of a prince of demons. Others accusing him of just being. <laughs> so, get ready to be called names, brothers and sisters. The time may be coming. Where uh, when you speak righteous words of biblical clarity, you will be called a bigot. Yes. And, and, and narrow-minded and uh, judgmental and so on and so forth. So move on down with me because I want to... Uh, uh, for All the way down if you would to, to 2 Thessalonians, still there on page 2. It says, since indeed God considers it just to replay, repay with affliction those who afflicted you. 
So you know what I don't have to worry about? Whether or not they get it now. You know what also I don't need to worry about? Whether or not I'm delivered now. Now does that mean I, I, I don't want the oppression to stop? I still want it to stop. <laughs> I don't want the injustice to stop. I still want it to stop. But if it's bent, and if it's supposed to be bent, if we're living in bent days, and that's the way it's going to be. Look, uh, to replay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. I just want to note that for you. The promise that all pains come to an end is at the second coming of Jesus. Not necessarily sooner than that. So, so the, this whole span of, uh, uh, of our days might be difficult and might be problematic. We might, uh, and we've been pretty free in America, but Christians in some other countries have faced nothing but constant affliction and oppression, and they do so for the totality of their days. That's all they ever know. And after 50 years of it, you can't say, Why haven't you delivered me, O oh God? Why haven't you kept your promise? Here's the promise. They will pay, and you will be delivered when Jesus returns. Okay, and you can keep reading that and see the strength of the power of Jesus' return. Now for our... our Last consideration, uh, uh, it, it's interesting because he, he's jumping, uh, as he gets through here, he starts jumping from one thought to another thought. This seems futile, and this th seems futile, and it seems like his thoughts are disconnected. Uh, they're not disconnected, even if they are uh, disparate. They're not disconnected because what connects them is a sense of futility. <laughs> All right. And so sometimes he's, he's wanting to jump from one thing to a completely different topic to, to just, just show the full array of how everything tends to, to get messed up. And, he, and, and what, he, what he unpacks in the early part here then of chapter 4, and this will be the last thing that we unpack today, is sort of a balanced, that should be a D in the notes, not balances. Or maybe I'm trying to say he balances the perspective on life and labor. Okay, He warns against excessive industriousness. Okay, you've, you've heard uh, the, the phrase um, workaholic. You've heard, you heard that phrase before, you know, uh, even, even the kind of thing, sitting in an inter interview, would you tell me what is, uh, what's one of your greatest weaknesses? I, I never know when to stop working, I just work so hard, I just work, I'm, I'm just the hardest worker in any place I go. That's my weakness. Um, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I mean, you've heard that kind of notion. I, I don't think that sells it. I don't know, think anyone's buying that. But there are people who, who give themselves to that. And they just work and work and work and work and work and work and work. And sometimes it's, it's motivated by trying to amass and accumulate and get and get. Sometimes it's to accomplish and accomplish. But they're... The work is good, and hard work is good. There is such a thing as an excess industriousness. He says in chapter 4, verse 4, Then I saw all toil and all skill in work comes from a man's envy of his neighbor. All right, so I'm speaking here of man's meaningless motives to hard work and achievement. Why are you doing that? 
You, are, do you think you're impressing God? Do you think when you get a bunch of money and buy stuff, God will be impressed to see you having that? You know? Look, I, I have tell people this when we, if we slow it down. You know, uh, I remember at some point along the way, you know, my son growing up, people, kids love sports cars. You know, and, and it begins to be a curious question along the way, looking around, it's like, how come everybody who has a Corvette is in their 60s? <laughs> you know, it seems like, you know, uh, uh, just a, a, a young guy's power car, what is that? Uh, it's too expensive. <laughs> a, a person's got to work a long time to build up the kind of funds necessary to buy that kind of a car. Uh, but look, you get that or, or e- e- raise your sights a little higher on a Lamborghini, your Maserati, or, 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 or even a personalized one-of-a-kind Bugatti or whatever you're thinking of. You think, wow, I like it. Uh, you get it. Your neighbors may be impressed. Your children may be impressed. Do you think God is impressed? Hey God, have a look at my car. You mean that little work of man's hands? (laughs) The heavens and the highest heaven and the earth and all that is in it. You know, from shooting stars to sunrise and sunsets, from the, the, the northern lights, all the magnificence that, that is seen in creation, that's the work of God's hands. And, and that is far more impressive than, than, than if we think about the immensity of God, you know. I, I picture it like this. Some kid coming with a Hot Wheels. Look at this. Bet you wish you had this. Isn't, isn't, this, isn't this the best thing ever? Now my life is perfect. Kid, what's wrong with you? That's not going to get you anything. That's just, it's just a toy. No, uh, well, what is, what is a car to the Almighty God? And how long is it going to run anyways? And if you use it, what happens? It begins to lose its value. It begins to break down. All of this stuff. Excess industriousness ultimately gets you nowhere. Now what is interesting here, and I'll say this somewhat quickly. ESV, I think, handles it rightly. The King James handles it a little differently and doesn't seem to carry the sense of the Hebrew as clearly, but I don't think it's a wrong idea. What, What the ESV basically is saying is this. Listen, most of men's motives to do well is because of their jealousy, greed, and envy of others. They want to keep up with the Joneses. Or they want to one-up the Joneses. I know if your name happens to be Jones, that doesn't mean you're the source of that original phrase. Okay? But, but, that, but that's that sense. Or they, they, they want to one-up. Uh, you know, and, and I've heard of circumstances like this where uh, uh, so, uh, af, after a long time, uh, a car breaks down and a family gets a new car. And the next thing you know, the neighbor also gets a new car. Does it happen? It happens. You know, and maybe it's maybe it's the it's it's the same one, but it's 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 the next model up in terms of luxury uh, appointments. Uh, uh, well, but realistically, that's what what that's what motivates men, and that's what makes capitalism successful. <laughs> it does. Men th- know that uh, if, I pu- if I put out a better product, if I put out a better thing, then I, I will get better sales and I'll make more money and, and I want to have more money, so I'm going to put out a better product and it just pushes innovation and development and it causes for a season a society to thrive. But then also, it's a, it, this is the way that the King James puts it. It says, 
I considered all travail and every right work that for this a man is envied by his neighbor. So they're saying that uh, it, what it's trying to say is um, all your hard work, all it ends up getting you is envied by your neighbors. Whereas I think the ESV carries more of the sense. Part of your motivation is to be the envy of your neighbors. <laughs> People like that. Uh, but the, not only is there a warning um, on those things, because look what happens in chapter 4, verse 8. One person who has, uh, who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to his toil. Work, 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 work. But he, he, he's got no one to pass it on to. I mean, it's, it's, there's no real reason for all that he's doing. And you know what happens? His eyes are never satisfied with riches. How much is enough? The answer is always, just a little more. Well, is that enough now? No, just a little more. It just, it, it becomes a moving target. But you know what's amazing? From, from an overt over excess industriousness, which is not encouraged here. Hard work and responsibility is encouraged, but, but so much so that, you know, the, the whole, uh, some of you may remember that old song, the cat's in the cradle with the silver spoon, you know, the dad, he's, he's gone, he has no relationship with his kids, doesn't interact with them, he's always working, working, and then when he's, when he's old and retired and, and, and wants to spend a little time with his son, what does his son say? You ain't got time for you, Dad. Boom. I, I got other stuff that I'm going on. It's like, all right, so you, you wasted it. Now your kid is going to waste it. And, and it just goes on through, and you're not maximizing the, the opportunities for relationships and real impact that God has given to you. Because you've made it all about money and work and things. Now on the other side, you got the guy who wants to not work at all. The lazy fella. And he, he, just wants to, he just wants to take handouts and lives, live on uh, uh, people's givings. And it says this, and you can read what it, sa- what it says here in this excellent commentary section on it. But it says this in verse 5. He, f- the, it actually, it says, I think it says the fool. I don't know if I t- may have mis- uh, left off a letter there. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Now, please note that is a figure of speech. (laughs) It's basically saying, as he folds his hands and does not work, he wastes away. It's not... It's not, it's not literal. It's, it's self-destructive. You know, so one works himself into an eternal fervor and looks down on those who doesn't, don't labor as much as, as that person does and doesn't realize, look, all of that work is not, it's not what it's all about. You're doing all of that and you're, and, and you're, you're not engaging in the, in the relationships and in the life that God has called you to and placed you. He's placed you to be a blessing to people, to be an encouragement, to be a help, uh, to bear one another's burdens, to encourage one another, and, and you're always about this. Where the, the lazy person ends up not working. And on the other hand, he's very relational, but he's in everybody's business. Like in, in a busy body unhelpful, less than encouraging, damaging sort of way. Yep, she's back there. All right, and it's, so if you go with me to chapter 6, verse 10, it says this, a little slum, sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, like an armed man. Page 3. The sluggard does not plow in the autumn. He will seek at harvest time and have nothing. 
Uh, what I find interesting about that is what, what, what happened when it came time to, uh, to, to sow? He folded his hands. He didn't do anything. And yet, when it came time for harvest, what was he expecting? <laughs> He's expecting to get something. We call that entitled. I didn't do nothing, but I think I ought to get something. You ever heard anyone talk like that? Oh my goodness. You know, that's not new. You know, and I, and I warn us, people, we like to, we like to point fingers. It's a, it's a danger of our culture, and some people will say it's millennials, it's X generation, Z generation. I don't even know what all these generations are. And it's not just any one generation. It's men. Says, But don't forget what it tells us in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10 and following. Even when we were with you, we gave you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So you should not, somebody should not just expect handouts. You should expect to work and then be paid for your work and then be able to eat. You don't want to be overly given to work, but you cannot presume upon the kindness of others. And actually, God's Word is saying, you shouldn't. And strangely enough, though the church is going to come alongside the saints who are in need in a struggling season, in a time of loss and struggle, but if someone has decided, wow, the saints are more generous than any of my previous bosses were, from now on, uh-uh, uh-uh. Because what does it say? For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Because, look, someone can give their hand to, to tasks that have no eternal value. But not giving your hands to something means you're going to stick your hands in something anyways. You're going to get involved in people's life. And, and sometimes too much time on your hands is a bad thing. I think this is one of the things that people have started to learn during this COVID season. As a lot of people were without jobs or closed or at home, too much time on their hands... What did it do with, uh, with regard to depression? What did it do with, re- with regard to uh, ab- abuse of others in the home? Horrible increase. What did it do with regard to suicides? Horrible increase. I, it, it, statistics aren't out yet. But I think it's unlikely that marriages were significantly strengthened through this. <laughs> you know, in, in many circumstances, you push two sinners together for more time than usual. You know, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, but the, the reality, it, it, you, you get all of this strong warning here. Such persons we command in, and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living that idea of do their work quietly be responsible focus on your duty focus on your responsibility focus on doing it well meet your meet your needs satisfy that what's required look you want to esteem others as more important than yourselves but you don't want to to be the one who's constantly assessing their lifestyle, their work, their doings, their relationships, their you know, life. Coming down, and, and I'm going to have to zip this quickly. And the bottom part, anyways, I gave just for your own fun. So one excess, too much industriousness. The other excess, sloth, laziness. And then he gives a balance of labor and rest contentment and enjoyment what does he say in verse 6 better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and striving after the wind okay so 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 let's let's get this i got two hands right 
Two hands in toil mean that's all I ever do, over, over industrious. Hands folded means two hands are what? Not doing nothing. One hand full of, the idea of quietness is full of rest. And the other hand full of toil and labor gives me what? A good balance where I meet the needs and I meet the responsibilities of my family and I meet my duties, but those, though my work and labor and achievements and accomplishments don't become my life and my identity to where some people, when they retire, they soon expire because they got nothing because that was who they were, right? Whereas... You got you to have that balance. One handful of rest and one handful of the other. Not two hands resting folded. Not two hands in labor. Now look, there may be times where two hands got to get over here. And hopefully you can balance that out by, by, by brief seasons of little vacation time over here. But an ideal balance is working both those things, that we don't lose sight on the priority of relationships, the priority of seeking the Lord, the priority of serving the Lord in the, in the midst of all of our human endeavors, as good as they are and necessary and something we should not let go of, both need to be there. And so, we again, First Thessalonians says it this way, to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs. And to work with your hands as we instructed you. So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on none. So he's calling us to be, I, I, I would like to say it this way. He's calling us to be hard working and hard resting. You know, uh, hard laboring and hard loving. A balance of these things. You know, which isn't easy to achieve, but we want to aspire to it. And as such, unlike the over-industrious person, we want to, Philippians 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Why are you doing that? I mean, when, when you get that new... Does it, who does it impress? And does impressing them really matter? You know, and, uh, and, and, and so on. For, or, or, or the accolades, the esteem, the pride, the position, does, does that really matter because sometimes those things can be stripped in a heartbeat okay um, and a warning about those things and I close by just encouraging you it had said this in that in that passage better is a handful of quietness than who two hands full of toil and so that just got my mind spinning and maybe someday this will become a lesson but I just thought I'm going to put it there for you because it's one of the rabbit trails I chase while studying <laughs> huh better is I wonder where all of the places are in scripture that say better is better is and give me those comparisons of what is better well there are <laughs> all the verses that uh give the wisdom of the betters. So, read those and pray through those for your own uh, benefit. Well, let's close this prayer. Lord, again, we are thankful that we could spend this time together and we, uh, just the, the simple realities and, and thankful your word addresses all these things. It reminds us of your, your absolute greatness, your, your independence and your power. It reminds us uh, of our weakness and our dependence and our need. It, it exalts you and it humbles us. And then it also reminds us of what our duties and responsibilities. And morally and spiritually, all men fail in those things because of their fallenness in Adam. But we thank you for the grace of God that sets us free and enables us to walk in degrees of faithfulness and in ways that are pleasing in your sight. But we thankful and we rest not with confidence in ourselves, but with confidence in Christ in whom we will stand before you. And then you've also instructed here that as we live, uh, work is good, but even good things can be taken in excess. Lord, we pray that uh, uh, labor and toil and work, that we would not over-esteem it, 
we would not be over consumed by it, that it would not be our identity, that our God-given responsibilities of, of relationships and seeking you and serving you and being a a genuine blessing to others, that those things would not be lost due to our earthly industriousness. But Lord, we pray that we would also not then make excuses to be lazy or to be slothful, but we would recognize that you have set forth a a good biblical balance between labor and rest and that we want to achieve a, a rich balance of these, that we can maximize the days that you have afforded to us, that we can meet our responsibilities, we can put food on our table, roof over our heads, but also that we can enjoy the families that you have given us, enjoy the brothers and sisters in Christ that you have, been, you have given to us, be used and be a blessing in their lives, that we would uh, function and faithfully fulfill those biblical priorities uh, of a father being a father and a mother being a mother, and that we love our children, that we discipline them, that we raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, that we don't merely provide for them, but we're there. Lord, even for husbands and wives, as you've given such clear instruction over and over of the relational responsibilities, Lord, we pray that those things would not be washed out with earthly duties um, rising above. Grant us a blessed balance that we would maximize our days to the benefit of others, and to your eternal blessed gloriousness. In Jesus' name, amen.